here at the, uh, the Wisdom Warriors Clubhouse. I like it here. I wish I were here more often. And uh, I'm really glad to be, uh, to be speaking uh, also for the Freedom Under Natural Law 3 online conference, which is uh, a very exciting opportunity for me. Um, I'm going to be speaking on the subject of Rudolf Steiner's book, The Philosophy of Freedom. Um, it's funny, the last time I spoke here, I know some of you were here when I spoke, I gave a general discussion about Rudolf Steiner. I neglected in my dissertation to mention this particular book, which uh, he wrote in the late 19th century, and which really formed kind of a keynote to a lot of what was to come later. Um, it's a book that uh, many, uh, I've known many anthroposophists who can't tolerate it, because they, they really, when they read Steiner, they want to really get into uh, the nitty gritty of the esoteric and uh, occult viewpoint that he has to share. And this is a book of philosophy, of epistemology. Um, and so it's very different. Then there are other, I've known other anthroposophists who, uh, who strictly focus on this book. This is the book that they think many people believe, and I, I'm inclined to believe too, if it had been more warmly received and taken seriously, would really have made a big difference in the way culture developed in the 20th century. If people had really followed the kind of thinking that he lays out in this book, The Philosophy of Freedom. Now, I don't ordinarily get up and speak about epistemology. It, it's a subject that can be quite dry for people who are not so inclined. Every once in a while, I feel I'll uh, go a little wild, take a stab at it. And so I'm here to do that. Uh, you know, some people really enjoy uh, Stephen King books or Robert Ludlum um, take some epistemology to, to really thrill me. So I hope you'll stick with me. This is not, um, not uh, quite, as, um, quite as far out as what I spoke about last time, but I think it's really important if we uh, stick through it. Um, I, there's a lot has been written about this book, and I, I actually, in preparing this talk, refrained from... Uh, delving into stuff like that. I've read stuff like that in the past, and a lot of it is very beautifully written and extremely, extremely insightful. But I decided really to just stick with the, the text of the book because uh, I really wanted it to be a, just purely an original. I mean, I've read a lot of these things, so it's no doubt stayed with me. But So I'll be quoting a lot from Steiner and the various philosophers that he invokes. And um, I hope you'll be able to stick with me through it. It's a, it's a pretty interesting thing, I think. Um, now, there are libraries are filled with, with what I don't know about philosophy and epistemology, but I've also read a lot of it, and I've read uh, a good percentage of the people that Steiner invokes in this particular book, so, um, so I can speak somewhat knowledgeably about them. Not as knowledgeably as I can speak about Steiner, though. Um, but if, we'd look at, if we want to look at the background uh, for which, in which this book was written, um, Steiner came of age in the, in the 19th century and uh, was very, very inspired by Goethe and Schiller and the various uh, uh, German Romantic philosophers, but he read everyone. And uh, what struck him is that within the entire philosophical canon from Spinoza in the 17th century through the 19th century, all the philosophers who really were considered significant, which really kind of culminated in the most influential at the time, which was Immanuel Kant, most of them had this uh, belief, this idea they came to that we could not know the thing in itself, that we couldn't really understand reality through our own perceptual faculties, through our thinking, through our cognition, through our concept forming, that we were too distant from the actual thing inside of ourselves. So, so I'll get to that during the course of this, but that's sort of the basis for why he wrote this book. He wanted to establish uh, through a very extremely thorough and detailed path of thinking, um, he wanted to establish an understanding of the world which we can arrive at as a solid basis for knowledge because this was really not present in the world at the time philosophically. And of course, what, what the philosophers say may not be understood by the average person, but it trickles down into society. And I really think that what we've ended up with in the world is a very solipsistic view of life. And this is, um, this is the result of really not um, being able to find uh, an epistemological foundation for thinking. 
So, um, uh, I can't go through everything in the book. It would take me at least a full day of talking. My voice would run out. You would be long gone. And I can't go through every single objection that Steiner um, proposes to all these different philosophers. But, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll weave it in as best I can. And I'm not going to, also, I'm not going to explain the entire book. Um, because, mainly because this would deprive you of this remarkable and valuable experience of reading this book, um, taking the challenge uh, and discovering it for yourself. So I just, whenever I uh, write anything in the nature of literary criticism or analysis of movies or what have you, I'm always careful not to write in such a way that readers will think that it's a, that I'm presenting a replacement, you know, or a substitute for the experience of reading the book or watching the movie. I kind of think this is a real disservice and um, something vaguely criminal about it to me. Um, when my dad was alive, he would often send me uh, clippings from the New Yorker magazine that he was so devoted to about things that interested me. And, you know, invariably, I would read these articles and get the feeling from these snotty, condescending writers, you know, trying to explain Robert Crumb or Philip K. Dick to a New Yorker audience that their whole attitude was, you know, these you know, second-rate cultural artifacts are lumping and beneath your dignity, you know, and, but I'm going to explain it to you so that you can speak authoritatively at your next fancy dinner party or something. And, and inevitably, the writer misses the entire point. And so anyway, my hope is that this talk will at least whet somebody's appetite to take up this particular study. So in his preface, Steiner points out that life has many different realms. And for each one of these different realms, special sciences are developed. He points out that life, however, is a living whole. And so the more deeply these sciences specialize and try to penetrate into their specialized realms, they withdraw from this vision of the world as a unity. So he proposes that there must be a knowledge which seeks in the separate sciences the elements to lead them back once more to this fullness of life. So he believed that true philosophy was an art in the realm of concepts. So for Steiner, philosophers were artists. Uh, their artist materials were ideas. And the scientific method was their artistic technique. So the main theme of this book is how philosophy as an art is related to human freedom, what freedom is, and whether we do or can participate in it. Come on in and have a seat. So the book begins fairly abstractly, and this is what I'm going to be dealing with, where he draws very sharp outlines in order to reach clearly defined positions. Later on in the book, we're read into, led into more concrete examples from concrete life and stuff like that. So in the first chapter, he focuses on the subject of conscious human action. So are we free in our thinking and acting, or are we compelled by purely natural laws? And by natural laws, he refers to the iron necessities of nature. So Steiner was personally, personally acquainted with a philosopher named Edward von Hartmann who was a, a diehard Kantian. And he believed that spirit was merely a concept that existed in the human mind, and that freedom was an illusion based on ignorance. So this was the fundamental view of the age in which Steiner developed his thoughts. And uh, he quotes many philosophers who oppose this idea of human free will. One of these philosophers is David Friedrich Strauss. He was a, a big name at the time. You don't hear his name very often anymore. He was not concerned with the freedom of human will. He thought that it was an empty illusion that was recognized as such by every philosophy worthy of a name. Another he talks about is Herbert Spencer, who boils down the concept of free will to just a dogma that conceals the workings of desire. So according to Spencer, everything we do in life is merely motivated by desire, nothing else. So Steiner points out that these, um, up to this point, these philosophers who were opponents of freedom um, directed their attacks mainly against freedom of choice. And it doesn't really go a lot deeper than that. Um, and this is the truth. He traces this back to Spinoza, who in the 17th century considered freedom to be the action of a being from the pure necessity of its nature. So for Spinoza, freedom consists not in free decision, but in free necessity. So Spinoza considered God free because he acted out of necessity. God is all-knowing, all-doing. That's the only thing that God can do. 
So he's, act, he's free in that sense because he acts out of the necessity of his nature. So in order to demonstrate that humans have no freedom, Spinoza compares them to a stone rolling down a hill. It continues to roll even after the impact of the external cause has ended, stopped. So the continued motion of the stone, according to Spinoza, is due to compulsion and not to the necessity of its own nature. This is how he views mankind. So here's a quotation from Spinoza. What is true here for the stone is true also for every other particular thing, however complicated and many-sided it may be. Namely, that everything is necessarily determined by external causes to act in a fixed and definite manner. So this outlook became extremely characteristic of philosophy in general for centuries. So Spinoza imagines this stone which maintains its motion and thinks it is striving to the best of its ability to continue in motion and thus believes it absolutely itself, it's, believes itself to be free and keeps moving for no other reason than its own will to continue. But according to Spinoza, because a man is conscious of his action, he thinks himself to be its originator. But he's overlooking the fact that he's driven by causes which he cannot help but obey. So Spinoza claims that although we may be conscious of our desires, we remain ignorant of the causes by which they're determined. He uses very simple analogies um, because that's what philosophers do. They generally tend to go for the simplest analogy. So he says, like a child who wants milk, an angry person who wants revenge, a drunk man who says things that he would never say when he's sober, thinks he's, thinks he's doing it of his own free will. So now what Steiner points out though, is that this entire train of thought overlooks the simple fact that man is not only conscious of his action, but can also become conscious of these causes that guide him. So nobody denies that the child is unfree in its desire for milk. It's pure biological need. Or that the drunken man who says things he later regrets is not free. Neither of them know anything about the causes working in the depths of their organisms and which exercise irresistible control over them. But Steiner asks, is it justifiable to lump actions of this kind together with those in which a man is conscious not only of his actions, but also of the reasons which cause him to act? Isn't there a profound difference between knowing why I'm acting and not knowing it? Seems like a self-evident truth, but the opponents of free will never ask themselves whether a motive of action which one recognizes and carries through is to be regarded as compulsory in the same sense as that which causes a child to cry for milk. So Edward von Hartmann insists that human will depends on two main factors, motives and character. So uh, according to von Hartmann, who is a, very much uh, in the line of Kant, um, everything we do is according to the necessity of our characterological disposition. So we're not free. Um, it has to do with uh, um, a person's will is determined from without, so we adopt an idea or a mental picture of the motive for our action, but only if our character is such that this mental picture arouses a desire in us. So I allow, you know, to influence me uh, motives only which I've permeated with my consciousness and those which I follow without any clear knowledge of them. So we have to distinguish between an unconscious urge that springs from a blind impulse and a conscious motive of action. This is really key here. So what does it mean to have knowledge of the reasons for your actions? Um, what Steiner explains is that in this viewpoint, we've torn man in two. We have the knower and the doer. And what we're leaving out is the most important part we have to find, which is the knowing doer. So some people insist we're free only when we're controlled by our reason and not our animal passions. Or that it, what to be free means to be able to determine your life and action by purposes and deliberate decisions. But according to Steiner, this is not correct. This is nothing is to be gained by this kind of assertion because all these reasons and purposes and decisions, no matter how rational or how, how you know, deliberate they are, they may also exercise the same kind of compulsion over us as do your animal passions. So just because you get a rational decision doesn't mean you're free. The question is how the decision comes about within you. So if a person doesn't know why he performs an action, then it cannot be free. But what about an action for which the reasons are known? Our souls possess a very particular capacity without which we can't form a concept of knowledge about anything. 
And this activity is thinking. Now it sounds very obvious, but this is really a linchpin of where this all goes. And so we have to question the origin and meaning of thinking. So Steiner gets into very, very detailed thought about this. Because um, we recognize and understand what thinking in general means. If we do so, it'll be easier to get a clear idea about its role in human action. So as soon as our behavior, our actions, our conduct rises above just the sphere of satisfaction of purely animal desires, then our motives are always permeated by thoughts, by thinking. Um, for example, we have uh, ideal driving forces like love, pity, compassion, patriotism. These are driving forces which can't be analyzed away into cold intellectual concepts. People say here, and it's true, that the heart, the mood of the soul, holds sway in these, in these forces. But the heart and the mood of soul don't create the motives, they presuppose them, and they let them enter. So I see something that causes me to feel pity, something sad, and then I have a mental picture of it which arouses pity and allows it appear to appear in my consciousness. So the way to the heart is through the head. So love is no exception. And here Steiner becomes very, very delicate in his choice of words. If it is more than bare sexual instinct, he writes, then it depends on the mental picture we form of the beloved. The more idealistic, the closer to one's ideal these mental pictures are, the more blessed is our love. It is said that love makes us blind to the failings of the loved one, but this can also be expressed the other way around, namely, that love opens our eyes for the good qualities. Many people will pass by these good qualities without noticing them. When one notices them, however, love awakens in the soul. A mental picture is formed of what many others have failed to see. This love is not theirs because they lack the mental picture. So Steiner establishes that freedom is possible when the motives are conscious. And what we need to do is examine the origin of thinking. So this is chapter two of the book. He looks into the fundamental desire for knowledge. He describes humankind as, as a being, uh, beings who always demand more than the world of its own accord gives them. We look at nature and we want to know what does it mean? What is it about? Um, we have needs that nature has endowed with us. Some of them we can satisfy, but still more abundant are our desires. He says, we seem born to be dissatisfied, and our thirst for knowledge is but a special instance of this dissatisfaction. So when we look at nature and we have all these questions, every phenomenon we meet sets us on new, a new problem. Every experience is a riddle. We always seek explanations for what we experience. What we seek in things over and above what is, what is immediately given to us in them splits us into two parts. We confront the world as independent beings. We become conscious of our antithesis to it. The universe appears in two opposite parts, I and world. But we also feel that we belong to the world. We're beings within the universe. We're not entirely separate from it. So we're always seeking to bridge this antithesis, this bridging is the entire spiritual striving of mankind. The history of our spiritual life is a continuous search for the unity between ourselves and the world. Religion, art, science, all follow this aim, to bridge this gap between ourselves and the world. The situation is presented to us on the stage of history in the conflict between monism and dualism. So monism is the one world theory, dualism is the two world theory very complicated thing to understand, but I can try to explain it as simply as possible. Dualism pays attention to the separation between I and world, which human consciousness has brought about, and tries to reconcile these opposites. It can refer to spirit and matter, subject and object, thought and appearance. Whatever terms are used, dualism feels there must be a bridge. But inasmuch as we're aware of a self or an I, we put that self or I on the side of the spirit and in contrast it with the world, the world of matter, the realm of percepts which are given to the senses. In doing so, we put ourselves right into the middle of this antithesis of spirit and matter. And so dualism isn't really in a position to find this bridge. So monism pays attention only to the unity, attempting either to deny or slur over the opposites. Neither of these two points can satisfy us 
for they don't do justice to the facts, according to Steiner. Dualism sees in spirit and matter, I and world, two fundamentally different entities and can't grasp, therefore, how they interact with one another. How should spirit be aware of what goes on in matter, seeing as the essential nature of matter is alien to spirit? Or conversely, how should spirit act upon matter? How are we to transform matter so as to translate our intentions into actions? So monism isn't in much of a better position because it denies spirit and becomes materialism or denies matter and becomes one-sided spiritualism. So um, materialism, according to Steiner, can never offer a satisfactory explanation of the world because every attempt at an explanation must begin with the formation of thoughts about the world's phenomena. So materialism begins with the thought of matter or material processes. But in doing so, it is confronted by two different sets of facts, the material world and the thoughts about it. The materialist wants to make his thoughts intelligible by regarding them as purely material processes. The materialist thinks that the brain secretes thoughts, just like the liver secretes gall. So he believes thinking takes place in the brain the same way digestion takes place. So he overlooks that in doing this, in thinking this way, he is shifting the problem from one, pro from one place to another. He's not really thinking about his consciousness. He's ascribing the power of thinking to matter itself instead of to himself. Thus he goes back to the starting point. He's turned the attention away from the definite subject, his own I, and arrives at a vague indefinite image of something. On the other side, we have the spiritualistic theory. Now Steiner was an occultist and a, and a, and a, a spiritual thinker, but he always brought this from a place of, 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 of understanding that we live in the world of phenomena, of matter. And so he, um, he quotes uh, 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 a philosopher, a uh, German romantic philosopher, Johann Gottlieb Fichte, as an example of an extreme spiritualist. Um, Fichte attempts to derive the whole edifice of the world from the I, but what he actually accomplishes is a magnificent thought picture of the world with no content of experience. So just as the materialist can't argue the spirit away, the spiritualist, the one-sided spiritualist, can't argue away the world of matter, the outer world. So then next in this chapter, Steiner approaches the very peculiar philosophy of Friedrich Alba Lange, who believed that materialism is correct in that all phenomena, even our thinking, are products of purely material processes. But conversely, Lange also sees matter and its processes as being the product of our thinking. He holds that our senses only give us the effects of things, not true copies, much less the things themselves. So our thinking is produced by material processes, and these by the thinking of our eye. So Steiner likens Lange's viewpoint to the story of Baron von Munchausen, who holds himself up in the air by his own pigtail. So anyway, there's this third form of monism that finds both matter and spirit already united even in the simplest entity, the atom. But nothing is gained by this either, according to Steiner, since it avoids the question of consciousness. How is it that si the simple entity, the simplest entity, manifests itself in a twofold way if it is an indivisible unity? So against all these theories, we have to realize that the basic and primary opposition first appears in our own consciousness. It's we ourselves who break away from the bosom of nature and contrast ourselves as I with the world. This happens in very early childhood. Right? So yet, however true it is that we've estranged ourselves from nature, it's also true that we feel a part of her, we belong to her, and it can only be nature working that nature's workings that pulsates inside of us, that makes us alive. So Steiner says we have to find our way back to her. And uh, according to Steiner, a simple reflection can point this way to us. We have to find that part of nature which we have taken into our own being. We must seek it out and then we will find a connection with her. So Steiner states he's not interested in speculating here in this book about the interaction of nature and spirit, but rather to probe into the depths of our own being to learn where we can find those elements saved in our flight from nature, where they reside. We must be able to say to ourselves, here we are no longer merely I, myself. Here is something which is more than I. At this point, Steiner steps outside of 
what he's describing in response to people who might find all this talk very unscientific. But he explains he's not interested in scientific results, but a simple description of what we all experience in consciousness. So in the third chapter, Steiner approaches the subject of thinking in the service of knowledge. And here he stresses the significant difference between thinking and all the other activities as of the soul. So during the course of this chapter, he very thoroughly explains how all of our spiritual striving depends on observation and thinking, insofar as we are conscious of this striving. These are the two main fo things he focuses on. He begins by describing observation uh, with the example of a game of billiards. So we observe a ball being struck by the cue, and it communicates its motion to another ball. We have no influence over the course on the course of the observed process. Of course, the person playing pool has an influence on it, but we're the observer here. So if we're merely spectators, we can only speak about the movement of the second ball when it's taken place. It's quite different, though, if we begin to reflect on the content of our observation. This reflection has the purpose of forming concepts of the event. This reflection forms concepts of what we observe. So we connect the concept of a ball with other concepts from mechanics and other considerations. Elasticity, motion, impact, velocity, and so forth. All these different things come into, our, into play in, in, in our realm of concepts. So in this second activity, we're adding to the occurrence, which takes place without our assistance, a different process, which takes place in the conceptual sphere, which is entirely dependent on our own activity. So this event happens independently of me, but the conceptual process cannot occur without my assistance. Our observation can follow the parts, the balls moving, of any given event as it occurs, but their connection remains obscure without the help of concepts. When we observe an event, nothing is revealed about its connection with other events unless this observation is combined with thinking. Now, all of this sounds obvious, I realize, but it's, he's bringing us through a very, very detailed train of thought so we can get to something which, again, was very, very key in this book. So thanks for sticking with me. I know this, some of this may be a little bit tedious in a way, um, but I really want to impress these different ideas. So everything from the workings of common sense to the most complicated you know, uh, scientific research, everything depends on these two fundamental pillars of our spiritual life, observation and thinking. So philosophers start from various primary antitheses, subject and object, idea and reality, appearance and thing in itself, idea and will, concept and matter, force and substance, conscious and unconscious, and so forth. But all these antitheses are preceded by observation and thinking. This is the most important one for mankind. Whenever we want to state a principle, lay down a principle, we must either prove that we have observed it, that's the scientific method, or we must enunciate it in the form of clear thought which can be rethought by any other thinker. So every philosopher who wants to discuss his fundamental principles must express them in conceptual form, an activity that presupposes thinking. Without thinking, we can gain no knowledge of the world. It may, may play a minor part in the occurrences in the world. Many occurrences in the world are thoughtless, but if we want to form a view of them, thinking plays a major role. In sequence of time, observation comes before thinking, always. Everything that enters our experience, we first become aware of through observation. So the content of sensation, perception, contemplation, all feelings, acts of will, dreams, fantasies, mental pictures, illusions and hallucinations, they're all given to us through observation. But there is one object of observation which differs essentially from all the others. Can we guess what this is? Thinking. This is the object. Of course, you differ from me, but we're still objects of observation. But this thinking is very, very different. Good guess. The observation of a table or a tree or a person, it occurs as soon as these objects appear upon the horizon of experience. But in ordinary life, I don't observe my thinking about these things. 
If in addition to observing the table, I also want to observe my thoughts about the table, then I have to take a standpoint outside of this activity. It's a separate standpoint. So Steiner has led us from observation of thinking into thinking about thinking. So part of the peculiar nature of thinking is that the thinker tends to forget about his thinking while he's engaged in it. We generally don't think while we're thinking. We don't think about thinking. So we may say that thinking is the unobserved element in our ordinary mental and spiritual life. The reason we don't observe thinking in ordinary life is that it's due to our own activity. Whatever we don't produce ourselves appears in our field of awareness as an object. I, might, I find myself confronted by it as something which comes to meet me. I must accept it as something that precedes my thinking process. It's a premise, everything given. I contemplate it by thinking, and while I am thinking, I don't pay heed to my thinking, which is of my own making, but rather to the object of my thinking, which is not of my making. Moreover, I am in the same position when I enter into the exceptional state and reflect on my own thinking. I can't observe it while I'm doing it. I can only subsequently take my experience of thinking as the object of a new thought. It can only be accomplished in two separate acts. I have to think, and then I have to think about the thought. This is recognized even in the book of Genesis, where God created the world in six days, and only when it is there can he contemplate it. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was good. Very good, actually. The same applies to our own thinking. It must be there first before we can observe it. So for everyone who has the ability to observe their own thinking, and with goodwill, every normal person can do this, this observation is the most important one he can possibly make. It's a bold statement. For he observes something of which he himself is the creator and is confronted with not a foreign object, but his own activity. He knows how it comes into being, and he sees into its connections and relationships. He knows how it comes into be. Uh, he's right. A firm point has now been reached from which one can, with some hope of success, seek an explanation for all other phenomena. So this is where Steiner is beginning to overcome this Kantian prejudice that we cannot understand phenomena in the world through thinking. We can think and think and think about it, but we're only ever think dealing with mental images. This is the prejudice of philosophy up until this book. So in making the act of thinking into our, an object of our observation, we, we're, not at, we're not adding to the number of objects we observe, only we're actually adding one thing to the number of the objects we observe, sorry, but not to the number of methods. So while we're observing all the other things and processes in the world, something is overlooked, something different from all the other processes. But when I observe my own thinking, there's no such, no such neglected element. That's the one thing that we overlook. So this object of observation, thinking, is qualitatively identical with the activity directed upon it. This is another characteristic feature of thinking, that when we make it an object of observation, we are not compelled to do so with the help of something qualitatively different, but can remain within the same element. Here Steiner brings up the words of a bold nature philosopher named Friedrich Schelling. And Friedrich Schelling says, to know nature means to create nature. This was the primary basis of his philosophy. He points, Steiner points out that to take these words literally, we must renounce forever all hope of gaining knowledge of nature. Nature is already there before us, and we, in order to create it a second time, we'd need to know the principles according to which it had originated. From the nature which already exists, you would have to borrow or crib its fundamental principles to create a new nature. Now, this is a fairly minor point in the book, but I bring it up because it does uh, beg the question of what we're dealing with now in the world in the realm of genetics, artificial intelligence, all these things. Has mankind, you know, cribbed this and, I don't know, jumped the gun, so to speak. Anyway, you'd have to do all this borrowing before you got to creating it, which means you would know nature. And so the only kind of nature we could create without first knowing it would be a nature that doesn't exist. So he dispenses with this particular viewpoint from Schelling. So what we really cannot do with regard to nature, which is namely creating before knowing, 
we can achieve with thinking. If we, refrain from, if we refrain from thinking until we had first gained knowledge of it, we would never come to it at all. We resolutely plunge right into the act of thinking, and then afterwards, by observing what we've done, we gain knowledge of it. So while the presence of all other objects is taken care of with no activity on our part, for the observation of thinking, we ourselves first create an object. There's no other process that works like this. We digest without having studied the process, physiological process of digestion. It, digestion can't become the object of digestion, while thinking can become the object of thinking, and so on. So in thinking, we have got a hold of one corner of the whole world process, which requires our presence if anything is to happen. And this is just the point upon which everything turns. Things in the world puzzle me because I play no part in their production. They are simply given to me. In the case of thinking, however, I know how it is done. Hence, for the study of all that happens in the world, there can be no more fundamental starting point than thinking itself. In thinking, you have a principle which subsists in, through itself. And Steiner proposes, therefore, that we try to understand the world starting from this basis. We can grasp thinking by means of itself. The question remains whether we can also grasp anything else through it. This was the question that stood before him and was the end result of the entirety of the philosophical tradition. Can we grasp anything in reality through thinking? This is what has led to the state of solipsism in which we find ourselves now. Solipsism is the viewpoint that only we can only know about ourselves. We can't know about the world. So this chapter ends with a discussion of consciousness because all these philosophers who preceded him, they, cl they claimed that, that Consciousness precedes thinking, and therefore we ought to start not from thinking, but from consciousness. So now, the Creator, of course, had to, if we believe in this, had to create consciousness in order to have uh, a vehicle for thinking to happen. But, uh, so, it's true in a sense that consciousness precedes thinking, but the philosopher isn't concerned with creating the world, he's concerned with understanding it. So we have to seek a starting point, and that would be thinking, not create, not uh, consciousness. So, and furthermore, it's interesting to think about if all these philosophers believed um, that we haven't even established whether thinking is in fact able to give us insight into things at all, how does it help us to start subjecting consciousness to the scrutiny of thinking? So the scrutiny of thinking is something to develop. We need to look impartially at thinking before anything else can be understood. This is a very unusual idea. And to do this, Steiner explains, we really need to be in the present moment. In order to understand and explain the world by means of concepts, we can't go back in time and start from the elements of existence which came first, whatever those might have been. But rather, we have to begin in the present moment with the element that is given to us as the nearest and the most intimate. He felt that as long as philosophy goes on assuming all sorts of basic principles, such as atom, motion, matter, will, it's going to hang in the air. Only when the philosopher recognizes that which is last in time as his first point of attack, his first opportunity, will he ever reach his goal. The absolute last thing which world evolution has arrived at is thinking. So now we, we can study anthroposophy and learn through this that in earlier stages of evolution, mankind uh, uh, was thinking, but very much in a clairvoyant capacity, gradually we developed this intellectual capacity for thinking. Um, so again, this is uh, the, first, the, most, the last thing to develop. And this is what he, th where he thinks we have to make it our starting point, because it's readily available to us. So chapter four is called The World as Percept, and here he gets really into the nitty gritty of observing and thinking. So first he distinguishes concepts from ideas. Um, which both arise from thinking. So concepts can't be expressed in words, which can only draw attention to the fact that we have a concept. So when you observe a tree, your thinking reacts, and you add the, to the object an ideal element, the idea of a tree. You've seen other trees before. You feel this object and the ideal counterpart belong together. So when the object disappears from you, you still have the ideal counterpart. This is the concept of the object. Excuse me, as our experiences widen, the sum of our concepts increases, 
and they don't stand isolated from one another. Rather, they combine to form a systematically ordered whole. This could be called consciousness. For instance, the concept organism links to the concept orderly development and growth. Other concepts are based on single objects and merge together into a unity. All the concepts I form of the, of the lion merge into a collective concept, lion. In this way, all the separate concepts combine to form a closed conceptual system in which each has its special place. Now, ideas don't differ qualitatively from concepts, but they are fuller, more saturated, more comprehensive concepts. This is what an idea is. So ideas and concepts are acquired by thinking and they presuppose thinking. So Steiner wants us, to, you can't have them without thinking. So Steiner wants us really to bear in mind that thinking is still the starting point here. And this is where he differs from Hegel, who considered the concept as the primary thing, the primary original thing. Concepts can't be gained through observation, but are only added to observation which can be seen in the simple fact that a growing human being only slowly and gradually forms the concepts that correspond to the surrounding objects. So we, we observe something, we think about it, and we form concepts. He gives more examples of contemporary philosophers who misunderstand the relationship between these things. It's very interesting. Um, one example he gives is from life. He says, if you're walking through a field and you hear a noise, you first seek the concept which fits the observation. You're wondering, what, what could that be? Is that a squirrel? Is it a bird? Is it a, you know, a rock falling? Is there someone following me? Whatever, you have these different ideas. Um, if you don't have this, this, these concepts, you think no further. You hear the noise and keep walking. You leave it at that. But your reflection makes it clear that you have to regard the noise as an effect. When you connect the concept of effect with the perception of the noise, then you need to look for the cause because the concept of effect calls it that of cause. So your next step is to look for whatever is the cause. Maybe it's a bird. But you can't gain these concepts, cause and effect, only from observation. Observation evokes thinking, and it is thinking that first shows you how to link one separate experience to another. This is how life takes shape. He takes us from thinking to the thinker, because we are, being, we are beings in whom thinking and observation are combined. Human consciousness is, is, is the stage upon which concept and observation meet and become linked to one another. We observe a thing which appears to us as given, and as far as we think, we appear to ourselves as being active. The thing is an object, and we are the thinking subject. We have consciousness of objects and consciousness of ourselves, of self-consciousness, self-awareness we call this. When thinking contemplates its own activity, it makes its own essential being into an object, a thing. Steiner here draws our attention to the fact with that, that with the help of thinking, I can distinguish myself as subject from objects. Therefore, thinking will never be regarded as a merely subjective activity. It distinguishes subject and object. Thinking lies beyond subject and object. It produces these two concepts just as it produces all others, thinking. When, therefore, I refer a concept to an object, this is not to be thought of as something purely subjective. It's not the subject that makes the reference, but the thinking. Again, this is taking us beyond all previous philosophical thinking. It seems so obvious, but philosophers had not reached this point. The subject does not think because it is a subject. Rather, it appears to itself as a subject because it can think. So thinking is neither subjective nor objective, but transcends both these concepts. He beautifully states this in the following words. I should never say that my individual subject thinks, but that my individual subject lives by the grace of thinking. Thinking thus leads me out of myself and connects me with the object, but at the same time, it separates me from the objects, inasmuch as it sets me as subject over against them. This is what constitutes the double nature of man. He thinks and thereby embraces both himself and the rest of the world, and at the same time, by means of thinking, he determines himself as, the indiv as an individual confronting things. 
Steiner proceeds to delve into the distinctions between percepts and objects, distinguishing quantitative and qualitative percepts and so forth. He carries the reader through to how a mistaken understanding of the subjective nature of our percepts and the failure to recognize the true relationship between mental picture and object led modern philosophy and humanity to the point of not grasping how we are in fact capable of perceiving things in themselves. So according to Steiner, the idea that we perceive not objects, but only our mental pictures, has led to this most convoluted nonsense imaginable. A philosopher named George Berkeley believed that nothing exists outside of our perceptions, that our perceptions arise directly through the omnipotence of God. I see a table because God, because God calls up this percept in me. For Berkeley, there are no real beings other than God and human spirits, and what we call the world only exists in these spirits. Now, most predominant in his time was the Kantian view, which limits our knowledge of the world to our mental pictures. Not because, as per Berkeley, things cannot exist beyond these mental pictures, but because it believes us to be so organized that we can experience only the changes in our own selves, but not the things in themselves that cause these changes. So according to Immanuel Kant, it's not that there is no reality independent of our mental pictures, only that the subject cannot directly assimilate this reality. We can only imagine it, invent it, think it, cognize it, or even fail to cognize it. Our inability to distinguish the subject of perception from the I, this latter being the stable element in contrast to the continual coming and going of percept pictures, have left us, left, has left us without a secure sense of what the self even is. Briefly, the thinking goes like this. And this brings up, may bring up in you ideas about a simulation theory, this contemporary idea. Our natural state is to believe that things as we perceive them exist also outside our consciousness. This is how we experience reality. I see you, you exist there outside my consciousness. But physics, physiology, and psychology seem to teach us that our bodily organization is paramount over these perceptions, and that therefore we cannot know anything about an external object except what our biological organiza organization transmits to us. This is one of the main failings of the materialism we've inherited. So our percepts are thus modifications of our organization, not things in themselves, our percepts being all those things that we perceive. This leads to the conviction that we can only uh, have direct knowledge of our own mental pictures. When we see or hear a trumpet, of course we immediately have the mental picture and the concept of a trumpet. But according to this worldview, the external object has been entirely lost on the way to the brain, going through the sense organs and the nerves, and then from the brain to the soul. The very last link in this process is that for wh which for consciousness is the first thing given. So it's a, it's, a, it's a, a strange thing that we ended up with this worldview, and it, it, I think it very much colors the way we uh, perceive and deal with reality, the way we've been dealing with uh, psychological operations at play in the world. Most people don't trust their own senses, and this is due to uh, you know, this fil fu fundamental philosophical lack. So as Steiner notes, it would be hard to find in the history of human culture another edifice of thought which has been built up with greater ingenuity and which on closer analysis collapses into nothing. So now the rest of the book gets deeper and deeper, goes closer and closer into looking how these errors have been constructed. He corrects them, supplying a conceptual basis for a solid foundation for knowledge, for understanding the human individuality, and for considering whether or not there are limits to knowledge. This is a big question he asks. What he concludes is basically, we don't know if there are limits to knowledge. Why should we act as if there are? Um, he succeeds where no other philosophers had ever gone, and he gives us the key for seeing reality and preparing the way for the possibility of thinking in freedom, developing moral imagination, and understanding the purpose and the value of life. So this, this is where the book goes on to. Um, I'm not going to go into all that because I feel I, it would strain your capacity, which I may already have strained. Hmm? 
yeah, 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 absolutely. At the very least, maybe I'll give another lecture in another six months on the subject. But it, it's, I, I would say that it is a thir just, just strict amount of time to talk to you. Keep going to the bathroom, stretch. No, yeah, yeah. Refocus on it. Yeah, yeah, sure. I can do that. But, but I'm not going to because uh, I think that it's, uh, it's important that people do this. If, if, if I've whetted anyone's appetite, if anyone has a, feels warmly disposed to, to such kinds of thoughts, I would really, really suggest delving into this book for yourself. Um, it's hard to imagine what might have developed in the world if this book had been warmly received. It was roundly ignored by the world of philosophy, can even the world of epistemology. I'm sorry? Can you characterize what you think that difference might have been? Uh, yeah, sure. I would think that uh, if people had, uh, if people in the 19th and early 20th century, in general, had been uh, exposed to this idea that our cognition and our thinking, our observation, our thinking, is actually connected to the objects in reality. Uh, I think that uh, we would not have been, um, I mean, it's really hard to speculate. It's really hard to speculate, but I think we would not have been uh, subject to the kind of um, uh, uh, materialism and uh, uh, fatalism that, that led uh, shortly to the Great War and the Second World War. This is what I think. If people had been able to keep their thinking alive, but the, the entire edifice of thought that they had inherited, and that, you know, again, like I say, I mean, most people are not reading Hegel or Kant, but, but you know, there's a, there, is a, there is a genuine trickle down into the world from these things. These things inform all the great minds. And so I think that we would have developed a spiritual scientific way of looking at the world. We would have been able to trust that we can develop thoughts beyond mere materialism. My feeling is that materialism is very valuable for figuring out how, you know, molecular structures work, how, you know, uh, certain things in the physical world can work. But if we had developed a spiritual scientific way of thinking, then we might have been able to penetrate into the etheric realm rather than just the physical realm. We might have been able to develop technology that operates through morality, that, you know, can may perhaps sense what is inside the soul of the operator. This is people are working on this. Whether or not we'll get there remains to be seen. So uh, I think that you know we had consciousness uh, developing, uh, but it was descending after uh, a certain point into purely one-sided intellectual thinking, which lends itself to materialistic thinking. And if we don't reascend with a, a, a kind of a spiritual consciousness, we will be dragged down into the thick of it. And that's where we're being pulled right now. This is, I think, what really is behind uh, the, the amount of, of uh, persuasion and, and, uh, and the, the deadly gravity that's pulled people into these psychological operations that are being perpetrated against us as human beings. You're suggesting that that format of thinking would render one more or less proof against the manipulation? Well, if you're able to um, really carry this thinking, I mean, like, you know, like God saw that it was created and it was good. We may not be capable of really good thinking, but I think that if we develop this, yeah, I think this is a way that we can, uh, we can develop this kind of thinking that could, um, again, if it permeated society, I think it create, could create a much different view of the world. We wouldn't be wrapped in this idea that, oh, thinking only exists in my head. What I think has no influence on the world. I can't even know the world through it. You know, I mean, think of the entirety of existentialism. I mean, this was the result of, of uh, the, the despair people felt after the war. You know, Europe had been bashed around. And so people came up with this idea um, that only what exists inside of me I can know. But they were entirely limited to, uh, to, uh, to uh, this, this um, uh, uh, solipsistic view of the world. That only, I can only, you know, I can't find morality in the world, but I think uh, that morality is in the world. It's just a question of developing the kind of thinking that can can lead to it. This is this is uh, I think so. Yeah, I would say that it could have created an entirely different kind of thinking, and I think this is where we There's need to a go. A lot of questions and dialogues here. Sure. Uh, uh, one, one might be um, 
just taking, say, the group as a representative sample, sure. I wonder how many people feel constrained by their thoughts as, as divorced from reality. Does anybody have any, uh, how yeah, about you? <laughs> like what's going on in the world now, to me, I, I feel like um, I feel like I have no effect on, on what's happening. Um, because, yeah, I feel separated from it. Yeah. And yet, we know from, from what Gandhi said that, what did he say? He said, have you ever tried to sleep in a room with a mosquito? Right? So it's like we think, most people I think really do feel helpless. This is why we've got this, I mean, it's not that it was anything new, the stage of, of, of the world that we live in with the, the haves and the have-nots, the elites and the hoi polloi and the, uh, and so on and so forth. But, um, but we do have a, a situation. So I, I know what you're saying. I think I know what you're saying, which is that most of us feel we can connect with the world. And this, I think, is because maybe we are advanced thinkers. But if you, if you, uh, I think if you uh, go out into the world, you will meet a lot of people who do not trust their own thoughts and only trust the thoughts that are handed to them. I agree with that. Yep. And then from there comes, because what you're talking about is a, a unique and in-depth, um, assu assuming that, let, let's just posit that this is the, the best vehicle. Okay. Which, the, this book or this, what you have, yeah, you're, okay. Um, you're talking about something that, that relatively few people are going to have the capacity and the, uh, and develop the time and energy to actually pursue. Mm -hmm. So then you're, I, I would suppose, you're always going to have a very large mass of people who don't. Sure. And that, I guess, is something that you'd ask Mr. Steiner, how, how that plays out in his picture. Well, no, it's, it's a very simple answer, which is that the people who study this stuff are hopefully people who can have an influence on the world. This is the way things happen. We know this. So it's not a question of me expecting everybody to follow this. I, I'm just hoping that I can whet some people's appetite. Because, I mean, I would recommend studying it in a study group. I studied it a couple times in study groups. And uh, because uh, it's a social experience. I mean, it's a very solitary kind of thinking. But um, it can help. Um, but I would say that... Uh, if somebody develops this kind of thinking, really develops it into living thinking, then they might be a thought leader. And a thought leader can influence more people than, uh, than somebody who's not a thought leader. Does that answer your question? Well, I'm just curious in general. Um, I mean, I, I might suppose the activity you're engaged in now might be an example of what you're describing. Uh, could be. Could be. I hope so. Uh, Colm had a question. It was, it's more or less been covered by the subsequent mm. but I just thought that you outlined how the process of, of thought are conducted and the thing is that a lot of people are not utilizing their own their own processes and observation and figuring things out they're overwhelmingly influenced by other parties yes I think that's that they have forgotten the faculties that they have to determine what's the best way forward for them. They just submit to this onslaught of uh, propaganda and uh, it's, it's disheartening. It's disheartening to, 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 be very, to be very conscious of this process. Yeah. I concur. I concur 100%. This is why we're all here. Yes? Very much so. Yes, this is true. Yeah, well, it's it's the end, the never-ending struggle between uh, individualism and communitarianism. Uh, I think what Steiner felt about that was that the individual precedes the community. We live in community, and we need to work within community, but. Uh, for communitarianism to work and not to be forced on us from you know externally, we have to find our way to a selfless way of thinking about the world, and this can uh, this can be done in a variety of ways. Yeah, please. Yeah, I have a, a comment and a question. The comment is, I think that through Waldorf education, Steiner saw a way to try to open the possibility for every individual to develop their own true capacities for free thinking. 
right? Their own individualism, their own ego, or I, you know, and, and so Waldorf education is meant to be a vehicle to you know, bring that. Absolutely. To the masses. My question is, I would do that, it is, um, Steiner says in other places, and I don't recall that he said it in this book, um, that, that thinking itself is a spiritual activity. Mm -hmm. And there was a little bit of a hint of this mm -hmm. idea that the human being is kind of the, the, the coming together of the spiritual and material. Yes. Absolutely. And that it's through our thinking that we're actually bringing spirit into the do you want to comment on that in regards to the book? Yeah, well, that's a mouthful. Um, so yes, mankind is a is a, a a a being of body, soul, and spirit. Um, Steiner divides it further into the physical, the etheric, the astral, and the I, the ego, the self. Um, so the physical, we can connect with the mineral kingdom. This is what is readily perceptible to the senses. Then we enter into the world that is not perceptible to the senses, which natural science cannot really penetrate because it limits itself to what is perceptible to the senses. And we first come to the etheric world. This comes to expression in a lot of contemporary science as field properties. Um, so uh, the etheric world is um, an invisible world of formative forces. You could call it the architect of everything that, that's alive in the physical world. So the human etheric body is roughly the same size and shape as the physical body. Uh, often the head, the etheric head, swells outside of, its, of, its, of the physical head. Um, and it uh, it's, it's works with us, keeps the blood rushing, keeps, keeps us alive, and it's with us for as long as we're alive. Death is the separation of the physical from the etheric body. Um, the etheric body cannot be perceived by natural science, but we can perceive its activity, particularly if we're sensitive to it. So one thing we can all learn, we've all had our arm fall asleep on us, right? You leave something on it, uh, you, know, they, they, you know, the blood stops rushing or rushes slowly. But what Steiner explains is this is the withdrawal of the etheric forces in the physical body. Uh, so, um, so when this happens, oh, my father was in the Navy and he, they, they had been awake for a few days and they, they, they landed on Hawaii and they, uh, he lay, his friend laid down on the shore and fell asleep with his arms behind his head and woke up with gangrene and they had to chop both of his arms off. Because that's what happens when you lose the etheric body, all the life forces disappear and the body reverts to the mineral and begins to rot. This is what happens after death. After death, the etheric body actually lingers for about three days in the vicinity of the physical body. This is why, thank you. It's, been, it's considered important for, uh, for the, uh, to consider the spiritual life and to speak to the dead, with, particularly within the first three days after death, because they are still very much connected to the sphere of the earth. So then we go from the physical and the mineral to the etheric, which is also what we see in plants, because the etheric is the fourth is of growth, metamorphosis, and reproduction in every living being. So we have that activity in the plant life. All the plant kingdoms around us are physical and etheric. And then there's another element, which we call the astral, or you could also call it the emotional body of the human being. And this is what connects us with the animal world. These are where all the desires, you know, impulses of life are, are, are kept. And uh, so um, what we are currently working on in our, in our uh, activity is developing the ego. This is the self. This is what distinguishes us from all the other kingdoms. It's the I. It, which, it's what makes every human being a species unto themselves. Everyone has a unique biography. So this is the I, the self. And we are all, you know, when we say, oh, he's got a big ego, what we mean is they have an undeveloped ego because the highest capacity of the ego is selflessness when we can learn to give. That's what I was talking about when we were discussing 
a communitarianism. In order to be sensitive to the community, we need to refine our individuality. Otherwise, it just be, it's forced on us. This is what most people are eager to see happen. Not most people, but a lot of people. I think maybe the majority right now. And so, um, so all during our life, we're, we're working on our, on our I, on our ego, trying to, uh, to refine it, to temper it, to figure out ways that we can serve the world. This is, this is the highest function. Um, the work, uh, uh, a spiritual work, esoteric spiritual work that people do is to try to refine the astral body. This takes a little bit more work. It's not just necessarily day-to-day -day activities, but concentrated activity that really, in order to develop the ability to, to refrain from certain activities. When we enter into the sphere of desire, inevitably we enter into the sphere of the adversary. This is not to say that desire is bad. Desire is what goads us on, makes us alive. It's how we know we're human. But nonetheless, we have to consider that we have the possibility of exploiting others because of our desire. We have to consider this in every activity that we engage in. I mean, if we stopped and really thought about what we're doing, where does my suit come from? Where do, how many children have suffered for the making of my cell phone? If we really had to stop and consider this, every moment we would get nowhere. There's only so much activity we can do on the, on the development of the astral body. But this developed astral body will form the next higher phase of consciousness that we're heading towards. Beyond that, we work on the etheric body. This is really deep esoteric work. You know, at this point, we are, you know, I mean, maybe during the course of someone's life with an ex tremendous exertion of the will, you could alter the shape of your head. Maybe. We can't really work on the physical body. We're in a different state of, co of condition now. So, so anyway, um, this doesn't come up in the philosophy of freedom. This was what he was doing in this book was developing an edifice of thought that superseded all the pre-existing philosophical thought that would enable us to develop an apparatus for thinking that would really connect, you know, so he, like, you know, I, I, I took you through all this tedious stuff because I really wanted to really convey um, how, what incredible care and detail Steiner takes in this book to really, um, I mean, it's much better, I mean, I couldn't possibly do it justice, but to really familiarize ourselves with, with all these different elements of what goes into the most basic activity we have, thinking, you know, and how we can develop this activity so that we can actually confidently apprehend reality with it. And through that, not just apprehend the world of the visible, but apprehend the spiritual world. This book was what he felt was necessary to make a bridge between the entire philosophical and epistemological um, history into the esoteric world. So shortly after this, a few years later, he wrote a few more books along these lines, but he began at a certain age, he felt himself sufficiently prepared to speak about esoteric matters. And that's where he began a whole different thing. If, if this book had been warmly accepted by the world, it's quite possible he would have gone on to become a great renowned philosopher. He might never have gotten, he might never have been inclined to speak about all these esoteric things. The book was not particularly accepted. It was not well read. It was not well understood. And uh, as a result, he just went ahead with his work and started a, 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 a set of uh, initiatives that uh, brought to the world more social and spiritual renewal than had ever been accomplished by anyone, certainly in the 20th or 19th century. We have Waldorf schools, we have biodynamic agriculture, we have anthroposophical medicine, dentistry, art, architecture, social and spiritual renewal in every sphere of human activity.